Josh. Hi, Dave. I think we're live. Four months in a row. Um, for those of you that don't know me well or don't know Dave well, uh, Dave is my creative sidekick. I have known Dave since we were 16 years old playing high school basketball together. Um, the fact that he now works with me, I think, surprises everyone that we're still friends with from that age. Um, but you've been amazing because you have made me do things and brought things to life that would have never happened like this Java with Josh. Please t- tell tell me more about how awesome <laughs> I am. Not only did this concept come from you, but we are now in month four, and I'm happy that you've you've kept me doing this and made it easy to to get up and present and do all that stuff. So thanks, Josh. I like starting the morning off with some warm and fuzzies like that. I didn't even tell you I was going to do that. No, you didn't. I appreciate so, it. I appreciate it. Um, now this morning's coffee is. Brought to us by our friends from Brewpoint Coffee down the street from us. If you are in our office, um, it's just north of us a little bit. They have great coffee drinks and kind of a cool little atmosphere to sit in and hang out in. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to bring your microphone a little bit closer to your mouth there, Joshua. You're always so picky. Thank you. Let's do another cheers. And this time when we cheers, look at the camera so you get a good still. <laughs> Perfect. That'll be our thumbnail for September's event. Now he's going to ask people from Brewpoint for free coffee. Um mm-hmm. Last night was a big day for you, and you came in A, excited, and B, a little tired, because you took Landon to his very first Cubs game. That is true. Very first Cubs game, not first professional baseball game. We've been to a few, or he's been to a few Sox games. He's been to the Rockies game when we were out there visiting my family in July. A couple of Chicago Dogs games, but this was Wrigley Field, right? This is like, this is our baby. This is the Mecca. I mean, people come from around the world to see Wrigley Field. And at eight years old, he got his first experience. That's pretty cool. He did. And he got to experience all the new fancy, like, pavilion and cool, like, atmosphere they built outside. And I didn't realize how much work they'd done on the inside, too, with the new, like, patios and, like, the walkways. Um, he so was most was- excited for the new betting arena they have inside of there yeah oh yeah he was pumped he was placing bets like a madman uh no it was really cool you know his he had a grin on his face the whole first inning um uh cubs ended up losing we left around end of the sixth inning but he got his hot dog he got his fries he he got to experience the wave he got to experience obnoxious fans he got to experience people falling down the stairs because they're so hard to walk up and down so he got the full experience always and we saw it Jim Ricketts. Tom Ricketts. Tom Ricketts. You saw Jim. Jim Jim is his... It's like the less popular brother. Right. It's his long lost brother who happened to show up. But yeah, we saw Mr. Ricketts walking through the stadium. I only bring that up because I have fond memories of going to Wrigley with my father growing up. And it was a lot of fun. So I'm happy for Landon and you that you got to do that. Yeah, it was awesome. But um, before we begin, I always got to start with some compliance. Everyone's favorite topic Uh, especially today, what we're going to talk about is strictly educational. Um, This is not advice. I'm happy to give you any advice, but that's going to require us to talk one-on-one so we know more about your individual situation. And this is actually um, more important today. Dave, you can can put me on here because I want to make sure we understand this. Um, I'm actually going to spend a little bit of time talking about things that you can do, actions that you can take that I haven't done in prior Java with Josh's, um, but make sure you realize that you need to talk to someone professionally about your situation before you act on these. So that's my compliance spiel for this morning before we get going here. Cool. So um, we got a few events coming up here. We do. You uh, Before we go here, you want to sp- tell people about those? Yeah, we have our upcoming social security workshop. You know, I say it a million times. It's still a tongue twister. Is that one of those words you have a hard time with? Yes. Um, we actually added a third time. So August 22nd at 1130 a.m. or 630 p.m. or Thursday, August 24th, 630 p.m. at the picturesque Lombard Lagoon Boathouse here in Lombard. And it is Josh's uh, workshop all about social security. Uh, goes over a whole bunch of Tips as to when to best take Social Security and all the other considerations you need to make before you start claiming Social Security. So that is open to anyone. We do ask you to RSVP. We made a easy link here at the bottom. Just go to fsrwealth.com slash SS. For Social Security. That's what the SS for stands for. Yeah. yeah. You're really creative. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Dave, yeah. would you mind sharing... The concept behind Java with Josh, what we're trying to achieve here today. Java with Josh, Josh, 
<laughs> a monthly live show where we wanted the opportunity or to uh, let you talk about topical, timely, relevant financial topics um, for everybody. So everybody can tune in and kind of hear what's going on with the market. And it's different than our podcast. It's different than our videos and everything else. Um, this is this is a 20-minute presentation by you at the most. What, what's cool about this is we uh, encourage y'all to submit questions ahead of time. You can actually submit questions during the show, and we'll do our best to address all of those. And to clarify, he'll do his best to address all those. Yeah, we don't let you answer questions. <clears throat> you don't want me answering questions. And uh, what I'd like to say is, ultimately, Josh, it's <clears throat> an opportunity for the people to see more Josh Brettel. I I think of this as a way to give timely talks in regards to um, <clears throat> what's going on currently in the market. People hear our thoughts on, on in more real time. We see our clients all of them at least once a year. Some of you multiple times a year. Um, we talk then, but we don't always get to talk about what's going on in the market in real time. So that uh, this allows us to do that, and people get their questions answered. You said it very m- much more eloquently than me. That's why I answer the questions. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so. Um, our next travel with Josh, write it down, get excited, is Wednesday, September 13th, again, 9.30 in the morning. Um, the topic, as it drives Dave and everyone here in the office crazy, will be decided probably two days ahead of time, uh, because we do try and keep it pretty uh, pretty timely in regards to what we're going to talk about. So, um, But let, uh, let's, uh, let's kind of get into this. Mm-hmm. Um, what you have on the screen, I saw Dave put this up here, is our new, it's not new anymore, it's almost a year old mission statement in the office. And um, this is, again, Dave kind of brought this to us as, where he, as he said to me, um, our old mission statement, which we still believe wholeheartedly in, which is tax-focused retirement planning, it doesn't describe everything that you do. It actually is just a portion of it. Um, he goes, and this is after him working here for a little bit, he goes, I've watched you change the way people look at their retirement. And he goes, you need to update your mission statement. And so we did it here. We called it giving you the confidence to make retirement the best part of your life. Um, This is something you've been looking forward to your entire life. And you deserve to have this be the best part of your life. And um, not only they, but your son, Al, who is only nine, has been looking forward to retirement. I tell that story in new workshops now. I mean, the kid has never had a job the day in his life. He's barely riding a bike, and yet he talks about retirement and how excited he is for it. So don't let him down. Uh, you deserve to have the best <laughs> retirement of your life. But um, today, we're going to talk about something that um, I've spent a little bit of time with on the last few Java with Josh's, but this time more than ever, is it's... it's applicable that you can take action on it now where people have been taking action and I've seen it done incorrectly. Um, and I want to make sure that if you're going to do something, we're doing it the right way in a thought out manner. So that's kind of today's job with Josh. If the term interest rates got you excited, it had, uh, you know, this is, this is for you because we're going to go dive deep into interest rates and how they apply to your situation. So Dave, doesn't that sound like a lot of fun? I'm ready, and if you hear me snoring, it's... um... We're not talking about Medicare. Oh, good then. Okay. So, um, all right, let's uh, let's dig into this. And um, Brian, can I have that that sign you made over there (laughs) before I begin here? (laughs) This is perfect. Um, So Dave and Brian uh, and other people in our office yell at me because they say I'm too serious when I start talking, both in a presentation... Uh, and here on camera. So Brian made this sign for me that says, smile, you're on candid camera, uh, to try and make me look happier, apparently. Uh, so if if you uh, see Brian waving that around in the background, I'll try and point it out and smile more. Another side note, we don't let Brian write our marketing copy because there's a clear grammatical error in that. It's your apostrophe R-E, not that. Love you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's get into this here. Um, and... Oh, you're seeing old stuff there, David. Gotcha. It's not my screen. Okay. Let's see here. That's why that happened. Uh, as you're bringing this up here, um, what he's bringing up is my presentation, which is the old presentation there. Um, Let's do this. But he, um, we're trying to talk about the own your retirement planning process. And um, no, no, not there. That's weird. Um, Try and plug it in and plug it back in. Okay. 
Um, just like any IT person would tell you, unplug it, plug it back in. It's mm-hmm. like he's worked for Comcast. Um, <laughs> the own your retirement plan process. This concept and this name, there we go. Nice. Comes from my father. My father was always big on telling us that you take control of your own situation, your own destiny. You don't let other people do that. And uh, we named our whole retirement planning process around this. And for most people in their working years, you, as long as you can control your paycheck and you have a paycheck coming in, you do control this. Uh, but in your retirement years, this be- all these other variables come into play and these things become really important. And another thing, you know, another, my father being as intelligent uh, as sometimes I forget or as a child you, you don't believe, uh, when I first started working with him back in 2003, Uh, He used to always say, retirement planning is nothing more than cash flow planning. And I was like, oh, yeah, sure, Dad, sure, Dad. And the more you do this, the more you realize it is nothing more than cash flow planning. Where is cash flow coming from? Um, So our planning process revolves around a few different areas. Um, First over here, this retirement income plan. What asset are you going to spend? Where are you going to spend it from? Um, Investments and wealth protection. This is... um, Still being funny, huh? It's really being funny. It's not. It's not showing anything fun here. Um, well, we're going to go through technical issues here on this whole thing, but um, <clears throat> investments and wealth protection. This is where um, Let's try switching the camera there. Your money is actually um, sitting. It's actually invested. Even though you retired, it doesn't mean you don't want it to grow. Uh, the third tax plan we're actually not going to spend time talking about today. Um, and but you know minimizing taxes becomes really important. Uh, healthcare, long-term care, spending the least amount uh, to get the best quality of services, and finally estate planning, which is tying all of the legal lens together. Now, today we're going to talk about the first two: income and investments. Um, and where we get into that is again with interest rates. Um, so, but all of these things do work in conjunction with each other. So. Dave, I'm gonna unplug and just replug. And yeah, I think for every happens. yeah for every slide, try doing it. it. Seemed to work last time. Um, let's see here. Yeah, uh, I'll go slowly on slides. Oh, we look oh. a little bit better here. Okay. We're seeing writing. Oh yeah, look at that. We, we may try. actually work this time. Okay. All right. So, I grew up in a house where I'm sure a lot of my peers did. That when we heard about interest rates, we heard about um, the first. My dad's first mortgage was over 18. percent uh, he was excited to get it at 8%. Um, when I went into school at the University of Illinois, they, the way we talked about inflation was like, this is going to be here, and this is going to be the number one thing that you help your clients with. Um, and then I graduated in May of 2003, and inflation was virtually a non-issue. So um, when we talk about this, if I look here, this just so happens that um, this graph corresponds with when I retired. I when I retired, when I graduated from school uh, and started working with retirees. And inflation, you can see, actually holds pretty constant all the way up and through this year. Um, now, a few things occurred. So inflation was relatively low and to the point where most retirees that we talked to up until really last year never even brought up inflation. It was not, you know, it wasn't really a concern. So it wasn't, they weren't worried about gas prices going up or milk going up or eggs going up or anything along those lines. Well, that has changed drastically. Now, I want to take a step back and give you a little bit of a history lesson here. Um, This time period right here, this was the financial crash of... Just so you know, it's not... Now it's not... Yeah, it's freezing up funny. Brian and I are in Google, just so you know. That little gray bar right there that you see on the left-hand side of the screen, that's the financial crash of 07, 08, 09. Um, And I don't remember how they got out of that, or one of the ways they got out of that was the quote-unquote TARP bailouts. This is the first real bailouts that we had. We bailed out the financial institutions. Um, Those That dollar amount came in at $475 billion dollars, billion with a B. Um, it took Congress over six months to pass it. It barely passed. And um, when it did, they thought this was going to cause inflation like crazy. Now, Dave, back to the graph here for me. What you're going to see it happen to post um, that is inflation didn't really change. It kind of stayed constant to where it was. Um, and then on the far right, that little skinny bar there, that was our recession that lasted about two months in 2020, the pandemic recession. 
and Congress didn't didn't really debate this at all. Instead of four hundred seventy five billion dollars, they added five trillion dollars to our system, and um, that is a massive increase in our money supply. And what you're going to see happened right after that is inflation skyrocketed. Inflation went up uh, to about a year ago, well over 9%. So what does that mean to you? What does that mean to retirees? Well, it means things cost more. And when things cost more for retirees, the government doesn't like that because retirees get unhappy. And... Um, and they try and act. They try and do something about it. The Federal Reserve doesn't like the inflation rates that high. So um, going in school, I'm going to unplug and replug here. Yep, yep. Uh, this is going to be a long day of this. Um, growing up in school, they taught us that the Federal Reserve had a few different ways to combat inflation. The first was um, messing around with the interest rates, and the second was messing around with the money supply. Money supply was they told banks how much money they could have inside of it. Well, over the last decade, they've really focused on interest rates. And this is the Fed funds rate. This is what the Federal Reserve sets. So what you're going to notice here, again, if we go backwards to that dark gray bar on the left, that is um, when they drastically dropped interest rates in 2007, 2008 to try and combat um, the uh, situation we were having um, post um, um the 08, the financial crisis of 08. Um, and they left them low all the way. They started trying to raise them up in 2016. You can see a really slow, gradual increase there. Um, and they dropped them back to zero again in the pandemic. But the, remember that TARP bailout versus the $5 trillion? Well, now all of a sudden that $5 trillion, that inflation comes in. And what the Fed has been doing is they have been raising interest rates the fastest they've ever raised them in history. And um, in we talked about this last time uh, to a point that it's not unprecedented the level of the interest rates, but the speed at which they did it. So what this has caused um, is I'm going to go back here, Dave, and show again. It's changed all the other interest rates, and um, oops. find it there. It's coming in. Let's see. Um, because the Federal Reserve only sets one interest rate. They only set what they call the overnight borrowing rate. The overnight borrowing rate is what uh, banks can borrow from each other at. The market sets all the other rates. Now, this graph you're about to see is the same one you saw at the very beginning. Um, it's going crazy. I wonder if it's a bad connection, too, because you hear it keep dinging. Hey, Brian, can you grab another USB-C, USB-C, or I'm sorry, USB-C, USB-C cable? Um, so what's happening here is um, we have these yield curves. Brian's messing with us for us here. Um, and normally, the way the... Um, federal reserve, the way the interest rates work is the longer term the interest rate, the higher it is because there's more risk involved in there. So lower term rates, lower, low, or sorry, shorter term rates, lower, longer term rates, higher. Um, we have completely flipped that um, where we now have what they call an inverted yield curve. And the inverted yield curve, the way that works is um, the shorter term rates are actually higher. So, for example, right now, uh, this number comes from the end of July, the, the three-month rate was at 5.42. Um, the 30-year rate was at 4%. That's not normal. That's not a normal thing that's occurred. Um, and so what's happened here is this has caused a rush to cash. Um, where people have um, normally it would, would say, hey, I'm not going to be in cash because I'd rather be in the market. Um, what's happening there is um, people are saying, hey, I'd rather be in cash in the market because it's got this, this, this short-term rates are so high. And so what we've seen 
Let's try it one more time. Let's it's, see it here. It's just farting out on us. Let's try it again. Oh, look at that. It's beautiful. Yeah, but Let's see how long this lasts. Long. It's uh, love technology. Um, what's happening here is you're seeing this rush to money market assets. Money market assets um, are short-term, less than one-year assets. And these are the assets that pay these interest rates. And what you're going to notice here, look at the time periods. So January of 03, that was the end of that little uh, financial issue. January of 09, $3.8 trillion. That was the peak of money markets there. Um, then we have May of 2020 and June of 2023. These are all peaks in money markets. $5.4 trillion in money markets in June of 2023. Now, you saw why this happens, or I told you why this happens, because short-term rates are so high. They said, why take the risk in the longer-term markets? But this creates its own risk. This has something, and Erin in our office gets really angry. She says, you need to talk about reinvestment risk more because these rates don't last. These rates are knee-jerk reactions that people, uh, that people take into consideration. And there will be a point when you have to do something else with this money and reinvestment risk is a real issue. Um, so that's a, uh, something that we, we have to talk about. But and I want to show you what this reinvestment risk is. If you look here, this is after the peaks. And so people rush to these. They rush to get into the, these 5% interest rates. But what happens here is you look, this is the 0306, the three years afterwards. Interest rates drop back down to 1.4%. U.S. equities come in at 16.4, well over their average there. Uh, 0809. Interest rates drop to rock bottoms. U.S. equities outperform drastically. Then we have here, again, 2020. Interest rates drop to 1%, and the markets, again, outperform. So we're, when you rush to these, you never get back in in time, and we have these performance issues. Uh, another way to, to describe this, this is, this is something different than the treasuries, but this is when the Fed is done raising interest rates, so that's the big question, when's the Fed done? Uh, if anybody knew, including the Fed, they, you know, somebody tell us. Um, but if you look down here, this is the months post-Fed hike, so when the Fed stops hiking interest rates, you can see what the performance of cash or treasuries does versus all the other instruments that we have out there. And so... By rushing to cash and thinking cash is going to be the answer forever, it creates this massive problem um, that we see going forward of, of Aaron is actually right, reinvestment risk. And that reinvestment risk is real. So um, this, this slide I'm not going to go through a ton of time on, but this is people love to chase returns. And we call this the periodic table of investment returns. And it takes different asset classes and ranks 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 their performance on a year-by-year -year basis. Um, so what you're going to see here, so for example, orange is REITs. REITs are real estate investment trust. Um, one year they're in the bottom third, then they're in the top third, then they're in the top, then they're down in the middle again, top, and they go down to the bottom for a while. You never know where you're going to get. But the problem is people will look in 2018, for example, they'll say, hey, cash was the best performer at 1.8%. Let's rush to cash. And then all of a sudden, 2019, cash is the worst performer there. And so we never want to, to, to do that um, with anything. So we actually have some suggestions here for you. This is, like I told you, the first time I was ever going to give suggestions. Uh, aren't you excited, Dave? Ecstatic. Dave normally listens to me, and sometimes I think he's confused. But this time, I can tell he's sweating a little bit because of the technical issues. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm a little worried to switch cameras. Like, is that going to make your iPad be like... Say like, oh man, I'm no longer the main camera source. But it, so I'm a little worried to switch. So we'll, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. We do have our IT slash compliance expert over here, just in case. Yeah. Well, I have some recommendations for everybody as they come out here. And this first one is a no-brainer. Um, it doesn't matter if we're talking about cash or equities or whatever it might be. Do not chase performance. And knowing some of the questions that I've seen come in here, I'm going to reiterate that a few times. Do not chase performance. Uh, this goes to the second one. 
have a plan you're comfortable sticking to. And again, I wrote these, so I think you're going to tell me there's some grammatical issues. I didn't run these past you. I think that's the wrong form of two. Or maybe you don't run a sentence with the, <laughs> with the preposition. I don't know. It's not my specialty. But um, have a plan you're comfortable sticking to. So if you're doing it yourself, if you have us doing it, if you have um, another advisor doing it, understand what they're doing behind the scenes and that you're comfortable sticking to it. Um, now, back to that, you want to make sure you're rebalancing. You're, you want to go through, and every year, things get out of whack, and you want to make sure you're revisiting that plan, and you're putting things back in shape the way they should be. But this last one here is where we really want to make sure that now is a time, if you think you want to make changes, we want you to think now about taking advantage of current market conditions. Um, some people will come in and say, hey, I don't like the risk I'm taking, or I like earning a guaranteed 5% a year. Um, and that makes you feel good. And it's a plan you can stick to. Well, if that's the case, we need to talk now, or you need to talk to your advisor now and re-change your plan because there are things that you can do. First off, if you are going to... Um, take advantage of current market conditions, one option you have is don't go for short-term rates. Let's look at a little bit longer-term rates. Um, maybe that is something we want to lock into. Um, and then also look at alternative options. So what do I mean by that? I, I mean two things. And the first is let's look at some non-correlated assets. Non-correlated assets means they don't operate the same way, um, they don't move in the same way that the, the um, equities market or the bond market does. And the other thing is, for a lot of our clients, you, you see a lot of different annuity options inside of your portfolios. Since I've started in 03, this is the best time in history to uh, utilize different annuity products because their rates are better than we've ever seen before. Their caps are better. Uh, their bonuses are better. And now is a time that if you want to do it, you need to be locking those in now. I think interest rates are here for a good amount of time. I think we have at least another year of high interest rates. But um, these products change all the time. And even if you have something now, if you have annuity now, uh, I used this line the other day um, when I was talking to my dad. And it was kind of an analogy. I said, you know, when interest rates go down, everyone's refinancing their mortgages. Refinance your mortgage, get a lower interest rate. When interest rates go up and we have a situation like we have now, for a lot of people, it may be the option that you can refinance an annuity product you're in. Um, or if you um, are thinking about one now, now may be the best time to actually get into one because you can get things that you couldn't get before. So with that, um, you know, that's kind of my, my advice and my thought process as we go through here. So, um, you know, I would say if, if nothing else, you were a champ through the technical difficulties, your usage of ums and, and mm, maybe have increased, but that's understandable. Dave, I rehearsed for this. I had everything planned out yeah. and we had a wonky cable. We had a wonky cable. Mm -hmm. So what um, happens when you don't buy Apple brand products, you buy like, I don't, the that one stuff. I don't know. Let's blame Brian though. Yeah. It's let's usually blame Brian. Yeah. He's. Uh, if you have questions, uh, either in general or from what I just said, now is the time to start writing those in. Um, I know we're going a little longer than we normally do. Um, I apologize for that. I hope it was worth it for you. But I do want to get to some of the questions that people um, that people wrote in. So, um, but um, let's go through here before we before we get into those. I do want to let people know. Um, Two things. One is if you want, I encourage anybody on this call, if you're a client, not a client, um, if you have questions that are specific to your situation, you can book a call directly with me. Um, it's at our website, fsrwealth.com slash Java. 
uh, J A V A, really creative. Um, or I also encourage you to sign up for our email list there so you will always know when future questions come out. So, um, again, now's the time. Write in your live questions if you have them. And I will, uh, I want to go through some of our questions that people asked as they wrote in ahead of time, if yep. you don't mind, uh, sure. mind going through that. I, we do, we do just had our first live comments. I'm going to pop this up on the screen really quick for yeah, you, sure. Josh, all right? Because we want to encourage those live questions here. This comes from Mr. Steve. And uh, it says, did you see where the Russian Central Bank raised rates 3.5% the other day? It was yesterday. Uh, Steve, I did not see that. Um, I believe it. I, Russian economics is not something I watch closely, but um, I actually have read that the Russian banking system is in more trouble now than it was at the start of the Ukraine war. So um, I didn't read too many details into that, but uh, if you want to talk further, I'd be happy to, to go into that. That's, that's, that's an interesting interesting thing to look at. So. Cool. So our first pre-submitted question was from Andrea Powell, and I will summarize this here. The word fiduciary has been used in the financial industry for a while now. Um, so she wants to learn a little bit more about what the word fiduciary means to us at FSR Wealth and how it impacts your clients, what it means to your clients. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about fiduciaries. All right. This is not on topic today, but it's a great question. Mm -hmm. And um, it's something I don't think we talk enough about is it's something that I just assume everybody is doing it this way and I realize they're not. So let's talk about the financial industry for a second here. There's two different levels of um, of guidance or compliance, or I don't know the right term to have in there, suitability, I guess, that an advisor could operate under. One is called a suitability standard. And a suitability standard is the lower of the two standards. Um, and all it says is, as an advisor, if I make a recommendation to you, it just has to be suitable for you. So as long as it will fit your situation, I can recommend it. Um, doesn't matter if I get paid more or less, I can you know, there may be a better product, a better thing to put your money into, um, but I get paid more. As long as it's suitable, I can put your money in there. That's the suitability standard. I do not believe in that. Uh, that's where our industry was. I mean, our industry was massively in the suitability standard. You know, over 95% of people were in that. Um, it has made a swing over to the fiduciary standard. The fiduciary standard, and this is a good thing, and this is when you hear about this, you'll go, well, why isn't you know, why wasn't it always this way? Um, the, the fiduciary standard says, when I make a recommendation to you, I have to recommend whatever I think is the absolute best for your situation, um, no matter what I get paid. And so what does that mean for us? Um, what it means for us is that we get paid pretty much the same amount, no matter where we put your money. We don't make any more or any less. Um, and we have to always do whatever we think is in the best interest for you. So um, we take that very seriously. We take it from a tax consideration. So we are, you know, I'm a CPA. My father's a CPA. Um, we, when we make tax recommendations as an office, we make them with a fiduciary mindset. Um, when we make investment recommendations, they're always done with a fiduciary mindset. So everything is, we try and cut out all the ancillary fees. You know exactly what you're paying us. Um, and um, that, that, Fiduciary standard means that we're always doing whatever is in the best interest for the client there. Cool. Thanks, Josh. Second question comes from Barbara and Barbara A. With the recent breach of, of P, PIA, personal identifying information at Medicare, how important is it to freeze our credit? Would you recommend it? And uh, is it pretty easy to unfreeze? Um. Your information is out there online, whether you like it or not. Uh, the Medicare breach is a great example that one you had no control over because every American that is over age of 65 is in our Medicare database um, as a country. You had no control over it was there or not. And if, and if information gets breached there, it's there. Um, so this is true for everybody. No matter what, watch your credit report all the time. So at least a minimum of once a year, pull your credit report, look for something weird, look and see if there's an odd um, credit pull, a new account you're not recognizing, a balance you don't know. Just staying on top of that is important. Now, there are, there's, there's another level to that. 
One is called credit monitoring. So credit monitoring is you are watching it all the time. There's a lot of services out there that do that. And you can just see and they'll, they'll notify you in real time when something happens. Um, like there's a new inquiry or a new account is open and you can be more proactive. I highly recommend credit monitoring. Um, there's an app on my phone I use um, called... I forget, but I'll put it in the link below here, what it's called. Uh, I'm not recommending it. I'm just saying I use it and it works well. But there's lots of other ones that do that. Um, but credit freezes are different. And for a lot of retirees, credit freezes will work. Uh, you're actually putting a freeze. You're calling those credit bureaus or you're going online. You're saying, freeze my credit. Don't let anybody else pull an inquiry. Don't let any accounts open. It's pretty simple to do. The only thing you have to know is that if you put... Um, if you need to pull your credit, you're gonna have to unfreeze it. Um, I have not personally done this. I know my in-laws have done it. I know people that have done it. It's a rather simple process, but you do have to think through it. I've done it. it it's it's great, and it's a matter of minutes to unfreeze it. Actually, seconds if you manage an account online. So it is worth it. Yeah. So. Okay, we have a next question from Deborah S. Fitch, not Abercrombie and Fitch. No, Fitch, no. Is, Fitch is a rating service. Okay, yeah. cool. All right, because I've never liked their clothes. Fitch has downgraded our credit rating from AAA to AA. Uh, BRICS, another acronym, I have no idea what that means. BRICS nations are meeting soon regarding replacing the U.S. dollar as number one currency. What say you? Um, this credit rating downgrade really impacted the market last week. Um, so there, there's a couple different credit rating services out there. Um, Standard and Poor's, Fitch is one, Moody's one. And they, they rate the credit of if you're going to lend money or borrow money from somebody. And the U.S. government has always been what they call the risk-free rate. It's the highest, most secure rate you can get. And, and Fitch downgraded them uh, last week. It doesn't really bother me, um, the downgrade. What, what bothers me more is um, the, the way that our government prints money and uses debt. But um, the down, so the downgrade, the rating is your ability to repay a debt. And the U.S. will never have an issue with repaying their debt because we own the printing presses. And... We our, our currency isn't backed by by anything, and that gets to your second part of your question um, about a currency that's backed by commodities, gold or minerals. Um, I am not worried about this in the least bit. Um, it's something that the talking heads on TV love to bring up. They love to talk about. But in order to go to reserve currency, just because those nations want to do it doesn't mean the rest of the world is going to do it. Uh, you look at what China's going through right now. China is going through its own little market meltdown. Um, so the U.S. is still the strongest, most powerful country in the world financially. Um, and in order to be a reserve currency... It's not, it's not a decision that one person makes and it happens overnight. This is a major, major thing. It would take 40 plus years, I believe, for that to happen and that to occur. So um, those talking heads on TV love to scare the snot out of you. And I'm not saying it's not something we shouldn't be concerned about, but it's not something that we're going to change our recommendations of how we make them right now um, because of, of what the BRICS countries are talking about. So I'd be happy to talk again more uh, in depth with you if you if you so desire to hear about that. This makes next question kind of even more relevant because I think it ties into it. But Dave J, our buddy Dave, uh, can you please comment on investing in gold and silver? Silver Pros, yeah. cons, recommendations, options, coins, ETFs, IRAs, blah, blah, blah. Gold and silver has long been a favorite. We've, a lot of people, we've seen a lot of people come in and say, I love my gold portfolio or whatever it might be. Um, Gold is a commodity. A commodity is a physical good. So a commodity is gold, silver, um, wood, tin, copper, things along those things we'll find in the earth. And um, you can trade those. Now, those are what we call non-correlated assets. And I think they do fit into a lot of people's portfolios, not as a major asset class, but in a well-diversified portfolio, I don't mind, hold, I don't mind holding those. Um, if you're truly fearful, people will hold gold because they think the world's coming to an end um, and they can still have their gold. Well, I think you know, if that's truly your fear, there's probably better things that you could be thinking about than, than gold that's out there. Um, but I do think gold can play a role in a well-diversified portfolio. 
Excellent, Josh. I'm going to read one more. We have and several I, more. I know Dave well, so Dave, I will follow up with you on that. And next time we talk, we can we can talk about the pros and cons of different spots for gold. There. We have like seven more questions. I'm just going to choose one and then have a comment on the rest of them. Uh, this comes from Charles F. Any comments on the impact of CBDC, mm, central bank digital currency, to John Q. Public? I don't know what that means, but um, I guess that means like for the average Joe. Yeah, John Q. Public is not a client of mine, no. but he... Um, <laughs> Central bank digital currency, this is, again, as people bring this up, I think it's something that uh, different uh, talking heads will use to scare people. I don't see, our central bank controls our currency. Um, they control the dollars that we spend. We already have a digital currency. Our digital currency today is the app on your phone, um, the you know, I can transfer money between my different bank accounts by logging in here. I don't physically go get cash and move it from one spot to another. That's a digital currency. Now, that digital currency is backed by the bank that holds it. So if I move money from my Chase account to my local community bank account, well, then it's Chase and Community Bank. They have. I have to rely on them. They have those monies that are there. A central bank digital currency, and there are different central banks going to this, um, and the U.S. has not said they're going to do it. They've said they're looking into it. All that means is instead of me having a, a, a Chase app or a Community Bank of Elmhurst app, I would actually have a, an app for the Federal Reserve. And that money, instead of being digital there, is being digital at the Federal Reserve. It doesn't scare me. Um, you know, the comment of what, you know, what's our government more likely to take away, guns or money? I think money is probably a better uh likelihood of that. Not, I'm not making a political statement. I just think it'll be easier to take money away than guns. Um, but they, um, I, I, it doesn't scare me. I think it's a really, I mean, you think, look at the reliance we have on our phones nowadays and uh, the digital currency, it, it's still backed by the same institution. Um, they still have the same amount of control over it. The Fed had, I mean, I'm, um, Charles, I think where you're going with this, and I, and I won't argue on this, is I think the Fed has way too much control over our financial lives. Um, but we're not, I can't change that. And so now you have to work with it and make sure that it's, it's doing it the best possible situation for you and for your family. So Cool. Thanks. And then to, to the Steve and Jim and Danielle and, and uh, those that we didn't answer your questions, we're just – we got to try to um, get going here. But I do want to address – Jim, real quick um, – I got your question ahead of time. Yours is really in depth, um, and I don't think it will apply to a lot of the people that we, we talk to. So I, I will answer yours on one on one. So Perfect. I apologize for that. Perfect. Um, so, Java with Josh, episode four. We are in uh, unique times here, Josh, with some uh, some interest rate mayhem, as I would say. Mayhem? Yeah. I wouldn't call it mayhem. No. But there's some differences in interest rates right now. Well, yeah. We just saw the new Turtles movie. It's called Mutant Mayhem. So it's kind of <laughs> on my mind here. Uh, so, I mean, essentially what I'm hearing is retirees just, they shouldn't make rash decisions, um, but they should, uh, there's, there's, there's opportunities that they can take here given the current situation. Man, with all the stuff going on, technically you are still listening. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Woohoo! Well, uh, thank you guys for joining us today at Job with Josh. Our next one again is September 13th. If you have time before then and you'd like to book a call with myself, again, fsrwealth.com slash java. And just to make sure that you get all of our future Java with Josh emails, sign up for our email list there as well. So, again, thank you for joining us, Dave. Thank yep. you for battling through uh, the technical issues. Yeah. Cheers. Blue point for the win. And, hey, book those calls with Josh. So I get <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. <laughs>